Well, hey, Real Life, it is great to see you. Welcome, everybody. So great to have you here. Uh, if you're first time here, we're so glad that you chose to check it out. And I uh, just want to say thank you uh, for everybody being here inside, outside, our incredible online community as well, Simi Valley, Lancaster, uh, everybody around these parts also. Uh, we're going to continue in our, our, our series, Drift, as we move into part two. If you missed last week, uh, make sure that you go back and you check out that. And if you were here last week, hey, thank you for coming back, okay? I appreciate that uh, because uh, we talked about about some very sensitive issues, and you guys were so, so generous and so kind, so thank you for doing that. Okay, just a, a moment of uh, complete honesty with each other. Have you ever had a moment where you locked up your car, didn't put the parking brake on, and as a result, when you came back out, your car was in a different place? Anybody ever have that happen before? We had that happen to the church truck years ago when we were still meeting in a movie theater. We had this huge truck that we put everything in, and then we would take it out and we would park it by our offices. And one Sunday afternoon, we parked the truck, went into the offices, in there for a few hours, came out, the truck was gone. We thought, uh-oh, it's been stolen, this is awful. And then we looked down the road, and it had rolled down the road, hopped the curb, and narrowly missed a fire hydrant. Can you imagine? We would have flooded the entire industrial center. I mean, I guess we could have considered it a baptism for a lot of different people and businesses, but I mean, it was, uh, <laughs> it, they're not going to get much better than that, friends. That's as funny as it gets. So, um, it, it, you know, it was, uh, it was a, a very, very near miss there, very, very scary. And now I've I found these online. I thought these were great. It's always fun to see people in worse predicaments than you, right? I mean, I don't even know where that happened, maybe out in town center. But anyway, here's another one. Uh, we see this car going over, no parking brake. And this one's my favorite here, this last one. The guy is trying to hold on to the car, okay? It's on its own. He's going to hold on to it. Now, hopefully, none of those are you, and hopefully, none of those um, have happened to you at any point in your life. But it's kind of a metaphor for what we're talking about in this series. And that is, for many of us, we have these kind of moments in our home or in our lives where we say, I'm putting the brake on. I am going to say no more. For many of us, it starts January 1. I'm going to lose 10 pounds, you know? And then, uh, you know, Valentine's Day hits and we, we add 20, right? Uh, or we say, I'm sick of this job and you, you're going to go back to school, or I'm going to make this marriage work, or you know what, when I go home, I'm putting my phone up. I'm not even going to deal with it anymore. I'm going to engage with the family. But then the break fails. Then we begin to just go our own direction, and we lose five pounds, but we gain ten. And we enroll in the classes, but then we drop out. We work on the marriage until we get mad. We stay off our phone until we get an alert. The reality is, is we all drift. The problem with that is we all feel a tremendous amount of guilt. We feel bad about it. We feel like a failure. We feel like we let people down. We feel like we're just stuck and we can't get out of our own way. And maybe that's actually why you're here today. You wouldn't consider yourself a church person, but somebody bribed you or threatened you or promised you something to eat and you showed up. And maybe you're here today because you feel like this is your chance to get unstuck, to stop drifting the wrong direction, to fix the marriage, to fix the family, to deal with an addiction, and you're trying to break out of the cycle that you've been stuck in. Now, you know the cycle I'm talking about, right? It starts with we say no, and then we slip up, and then we feel shameful. And our answer is usually to, I'm going to replace one of those words. Okay, I said no, and then I slipped up, but I'm going to replace shameful with, it's just a one-time thing. I promise you it never happened again, never happened again. But it does, and after a while, you replace it with, say no, slip up, and you replace shameful with, it's who I am. This is just what I do. I'm just wired this way. This is the way I deal. I just blow up and have anger, and you got to deal with it. That's me. But what if, what if instead of drifting into that kind of behavior, we found a different word to cross out? And that would be we say no, and then instead of slipping up, we find ourselves being helpful. 
Well, that's where we're headed over not just this week, but next week. And i got to tell you, today is a two-parter. Even though the series is four weeks, this message is really a two-parter that you got to come back for next week to hear how it all fits together. But what we're talking about today, this, this propensity that all of us have to drift into doing something we really didn't want to do, is just part of the human condition, isn't it? I mean, we have always wrestled with this. If you read through the Bible, you see people are doing the same thing that we're doing today. They slip up, they uh, decide they're going to you know, try to fix things, and then they find themselves being very shameful, and they don't know how to get out of that rut. We see this very early on in the scriptures as we read about the, the children of Israel, which we now call the nation of Israel or the Jewish people. And they basically witnessed one of the greatest miracles of all time besides the resurrection in around 1300 B.C. This was an incredible act that happened. Israel had been enslaved for about 400 years by the Egyptians. Basically five generations of people had only known slavery. They were uh, basically their own people until Egypt came in and decided they were going to build their empire on the backs of the Jewish people. And this was an awful life to live. I mean, there were no days off. There was no thought of retirement. There was no 401k. There was no vacation for a while to the uh, Mediterranean beach. This was day in, day out, labor, back-breaking work of building and building and building with random beatings and killings from the Egyptians who would come through and kill your kids or take your wife or knock you out. And it was harsh. And it was bitter. It was slavery. And it was an awful life to live. And they would cry out to God. And the scripture says that, says that God listened and brought about Moses to bring them out of slavery. Now think about that. That's all they knew. Moses shows up. Ten plagues go on to get the Pharaoh's attention to say, we're taking our people out of here. And the people of Israel are watching these ten plagues go on. There's blood and, and uh, gnats and locusts and all kinds of crazy things. And then, and then they finally get free from slavery. Now take a look at this map here we have of what's going on. The Great Sea we now call the Mediterranean Sea. And basically they're over here in the modern day Egypt, and they're going to cross this one stretch of water, uh, basically the, the Red Sea, but as they get up to that water, they realize they can't cross it, and they're stuck there. The Pharaoh has finally let them go. They get up to the, to the crest of the water, and they think, uh-oh, now what are we going to do? Now, at one moment, they were so excited because they got out of slavery, but now they're up against the water, and now they begin to hear the horses and the chariots of the Egyptian army coming to bring them back because Pharaoh has changed his mind. And the people, the people forget how bad it was in slavery. Take a look at what we read here in Exodus chapter 14. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and they panicked. Now keep this in mind. They just saw ten plagues come from God and yet now they're scared. They cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Why'd you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Now think about that. That place where we were beaten and killed and our children taken from us and forced into slavery, why'd you ever take us out of there? To bring us out here to where we would die. Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. I'm not so sure about that. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. You know the Lord, the one that did all those ten plagues to all the Egyptians but not to you? Stand still. And watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. 
Just stay calm. So Moses assures them that God's presence and power will protect them. They just need to keep it together. Just calm down for a second. And then the most amazing miracle that they will ever see in their lifetime, and probably the second greatest miracle we read about in scriptures, besides, of course, the resurrection, the Red Sea parts. And these people walk across what is now dry land. The Egyptian army comes storming through that, and God lets the waters go and wipes them all out. They are now on the other side of this sea, looking back and realizing God saved them. Think about that. They saw ten plagues. They saw Moses lead them out. They saw God part the waters. They saw God wipe out the Egyptian army. And now, here they are on the other side. Here's what happens. The scriptures tell us that they burst into song. They began to sing, and they began to dance, and they began to worship God for what he has done for them. And now they're living out in the desert, and their minds begin to change. Six weeks later, just six weeks, after the biggest miracle they have ever seen and ever will see, look what happens next. There, too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you've brought us into this wilderness to starve us to death. Now think about that for just a second. How ridiculous is it? 400 years of slavery. They see the plagues that God brings. They see God lead them out of slavery. They see God part the Red Sea so they can cross it. And then they get to the other side, and after six weeks, they're tired because they, they don't have what they had back in slavery, which was a little bit of meat and a little bit of onion. And they think, I think it was better back then. And we're looking at that from this side saying, why would you want to go back to slavery? But friends, we do the same thing. In fact, when the preferred future seems to be too difficult, sometimes we return to the familiarity of habits, addictions, and destructive relationships. I mean, think about it. We want to break free from an addiction only to run right back to it. We get out of one dysfunctional relationship and get into another one. We vow to never lose our temper again and then put our hand through a wall. We crawl out of debt only to jump right back in. When things get tough, we run back to our own version of slavery. Remember this video? It was all over Instagram, and we've shown it here before as well. But this is such a great picture of what you and I deal with on a daily basis. right back in to the ditch. And that's what you and I do all the time. We drift. We want to go forward, but we drift back to the familiar. Now, fast forward 2,000 years. you got the people of Israel. Now, fast forward 2,000 years, and now there's a, a, a child of the people of Israel, an Israelite by the name of Paul, who was a person that was far from Jesus and then became a Christ follower, and he knew what it was like to follow Jesus, but he also struggled. It may encourage you to know that even though we consider him to be the greatest Christian to ever live, he struggled with this whole idea of jumping back in the ditch just like you and just like me. Take a look at what Paul writes in a moment of complete transparency to this church in Rome. He writes this, the trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself. For I, what I want to do, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. 
I mean, have you ever thought about that? Why do we keep doing this? Why do I resist these things only to do them? Why do I eat with such great discipline before 8 o'clock and after 8 o'clock I act like an animal? You know, why do we do these stupid things? Why do I maintain sobriety for days and fall off the wagon? We all have these things that we question about ourselves. And the Apostle Paul says, me too. He continues on. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. In other words, there was the ceremonial law and the judicial law and the moral law. And the moral law is what the Christians continued to keep. And basically Paul is saying, you know what, I recognize that what I'm doing is wrong. I know that the law is right. In other words, God said, you shall have no other gods before me, but Don't we all find ourselves, we still keep putting money and stuff first? God says, you shall rest one day a week, and we still continue to think, I don't really need a break. God says, you shall not commit adultery, and we still fill our minds with pornographic and lustful images. He says, you shall not kill, and don't we struggle with hate? Paul says, I recognize what I do is is wrong, and so I'm not the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. This is a common theme in movies from uh, Morbius to uh, Venom, these characters that seem to be good, but there's something dark within them, and they're battling this back and forth. I mean, something inside of me is making bad choices. And then Paul writes this, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, not really the one doing wrong. It's the sin living in me that does it. And isn't that the pain that you and I feel? Why is it we take two steps forward only to take three steps back? Why is it that so many of us feel like we're swimming in peanut butter? We just can't make any progress. And the Apostle Paul says, me too. He continues on. He says, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death. I mean, how can you not love the Bible when you read that? Is there anything that speaks to the human condition more that says, I know what I should do, but I do just the opposite? Paul dealt with this. You and I deal with this. And the struggles that Paul would deal with were things that he dealt with before his conversion and still wrestles with after. So let's talk about that. Why do we do this? Why do we have this gravitational pull to our own life? For those of you that, are, that consider yourselves followers of Jesus, you prayed a prayer, you got baptized, and you've, you've started coming to church, and you wonder, why am I still prone to crave those things? Why do I still struggle with lust? Why do I still wrestle with greed? Why am I still so short-tempered and have anger issues? Why am I like the Israelites who have been rescued from my past but still want to go back to it? Why do I dream about the future but I just keep staring out the back window? Well, it has a lot to do with the difference between two big, what we like to call, stained glass words around here. And it's the words justification and sanctification. Let me just show you the difference between these two words, and I'll explain why it matters to you. Justification says not guilty. Sanctification is rehabilitation. 
Justification is one time. Sanctification is an ongoing process. Justification is forgiven. Sanctification is changed. Here's why I say this. Because for many of us, we have been justified by being baptized into Jesus, but we just stopped right there. Justification is just as if I never sinned. But then we wonder, why do we still struggle with these same addictions and the same old hurts and the same old habits? Because we didn't yield ourselves to sanctification, which is God basically making us in the image of his son. You know what it's like? <laughs> it's like, do you remember the Polaroid cameras? I mean, I know they were a big deal when a lot of us were younger, and then they kind of made a comeback, and a lot of our kids were using them. And basically, the Polaroid was you'd take the picture, and then after it printed out, it was amazing because you got a picture right there. You didn't have to take it down and wait like six days for them to bring it back to you, and they print it out there for everybody to walk by and see. But you got to actually get the photo right then. But was the photo good as soon as you got it? No. What would you have to do? You had to shake it. You had to shake it like a Polaroid. That's what you had to do, all right? And so you would shake that thing around, and you would wait, and nobody got the Polaroid out and looked at it and said, oh, that's terrible, and threw it away. Let's take it again. Because you knew that there was work to be done. You had to shake that thing, and you had to wait on that thing. That's sanctification. And most of us have given up or thought God can't help us when the moment we walk out of the baptistry, all of our old life doesn't go away. And Paul says, I wrestle with that too. In fact, for many of us, we kind of look at the whole thing of following Jesus like this picture here of this fine stick figure. And that is, we look at life like you're either in the Christian box or you're out of it. And a lot of us tend to think, I prayed a prayer, I got baptized, that's it, I'm in the box, now I'm going to heaven. But friends, all you did was get the justification part. God has forgiven you of your sin. But there is more to do. In fact, this is probably more of an accurate picture of what it means to follow Jesus. And that is, every day we keep moving towards the cross. Justification is the fact that God has declared you not guilty. Sanctification is, I want to make you look like Jesus. And for many of us, we've been throwing the Polaroid away before the shaking and the waiting. For all of us who wrestle with drifting back to the familiar instead of forward where we want to go, Paul is saying, I get it. I've lived it. I face this. I still struggle with my issues. In fact, Paul will tell us that he struggled with things like uh, depression and anxiety. He struggled with all of the guilt and the shame from his past, from, from torturing and imprisoning and killing Christians. And he says, I wrestle with those things too. Now let me ask you about this. What is it that keeps you up at night? What is it that keeps you from going forward? Is it you're still struggling with your addiction to pornography, your addiction to drugs, your tendency to go back to an affair? You can do what a lot of us do and say, that's just who I am. But the reality is, now you're a child of God. You get to have better than that. Paul is telling us, I get it. I'm right there with you, but there is a way to move forward. You don't have to always retreat to the familiar. But friends, this isn't just an individual thing. It's a corporate thing. Because Paul is talking to the nation of Israel, and he's dealing with them who struggle with constantly going back to the familiar instead of moving forward. So can I just talk to those who call Real Life Church home for just a second here? You're a follower of Jesus that goes to church here. Can I just tell you that familiar for you might be casual participation. Here's what I mean by that. COVID came around and you just got out of the habit of going to church. I appreciate the honesty of the many of you who are watching online who see me at the grocery store or at the golf course or somewhere at a Starbucks and you say, hey, I watch you every week and I just can't quite get out of the pajamas to come to church. I appreciate that. But at some point, 
you got to come back and participate. Familiar may be you just like to constantly complain. That's just who you are. You want to be something better than that, but you're stuck in the familiar drift to the old way of living. And there's just something in your mind that's always looking for the negative. Familiar for you might be just letting everybody else pay the bills. Here's what I mean by that. You know, 80% of our budget is taken care of by 20% of our people. And you see those great stories of the ways we're able to bless schools and help out people and help out individuals in our community. Join in on that. Don't go back to the familiar of letting everybody else do it. And for a lot of us, familiar has become Sunday is my day. Volunteering is too much. You get other people to do that because you've got other things to do. And once again, 80% of the work around here is done by 20% of the people. Friends, it is too easy to drift back to selfishness. I'm going to ask you to move forward in pursuing Christ with your everyday, daily life. And Paul says, don't, 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 don't take the way out of saying, I prayed a prayer, I got baptized, I'm in the box. He says, no, 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 we are following after Jesus. You take that Polaroid and you let life shake it and you let God develop you into the person you're becoming. And that's why Paul sums it all up with this last sentence. He goes through all of his dirty laundry of what he's done wrong and how he struggles, and then he just stops and he says, thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. The answer is in Jesus. He's the answer to you being saved and to you being changed. Left to yourself, you're a mess. Left to myself, I'm a mess. But with Jesus... I can break free. Next week, I'm going to teach you how to shake it like a Polaroid. We're going to figure out how we get this sanctification thing down. And I will not be dancing, but you know what I'm talking about here. But today we're going to stop with this. What is it in your life that you keep going back to that you know you've got to let go of? And it's time to let Jesus have that part of your life. It's the familiar, but you want to go forward. There's an old legend that says that in medieval times that the warriors, when they were baptized into Christ, would do so with their sword-carrying arm out of the water. As if to say, Jesus gets all of me except for my arm which carries the sword for my king. I think we do that still. But our arm out of the water is holding our, our, our wallet or a calendar, or an addiction, or a relationship. So here, what, here's what I want us to do here. I want us just to close your eyes for a second. And I want you to just think about what is it that you are holding back from God right now? Before we can move forward into him transforming us into the person that we want to become and he wants us to be. Let's deal with what's holding us back, what has us anchored to the past right now, which keeps dragging us back to the familiar. God, we want to move forward in this. So today I'm surrendering everything to you. Surrendering my tendency to be all about me. Maybe for you it's, it's you need to make him the Lord of your calendar. Maybe it's I'm making him the Lord of my money. It's really not mine anyway, God. It's all yours. You're making Jesus the Lord of your social media. You're making him the Lord of your addiction. You're making him the Lord of your goals. Make him the Lord of your relationships. Make him the Lord of your nights and your weekends. God, we have held on to something for so long, and all it's done is anchor us down. We want to move forward. We want to stop drifting into a place we don't want to go. So, God, 
we give all these to you. And God, for everybody right now who has yet to even say yes to you in the first place, I pray that today is the day right now they just simply say, Jesus, I'm deciding to follow you. And so God, over these next few moments as we take communion and we think about what Jesus has done for us in justifying us for our sin just so we can be just as if we never sinned, I pray right now that you would overwhelm us with your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to take communion right now and invite our ushers to go ahead and come down. And those of you watching online, it's a great chance for you to get some elements to remind you of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ that was broken and and poured out for you. And if you didn't get those elements, you can raise your hand and we'll get you one. But for everybody inside and outside and those watching online, let's take a few moments and let's take communion together right now.